1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. Paul the Apostle writing to the church at Corinth, and he says this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now we just could stop there and preach a while, and we will in a moment. This I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So in this corruptible shall I put on incorruption, and this mortal shall I put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Yes. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Anybody thankful here this morning? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. There's no doubt about that statement, by the way. Amen. It's not a maybe. It's not an if. It's not a well, if I do everything right. He says, God, through Christ, giveth us the victory. Amen. I'm looking at a group of overcomers this morning. Hallelujah. And I want you to know it, that you have the victory in Christ Jesus. Amen. Not in yourself, not in your church, not in what you do, Amen. but in whom you have believed. You have the victory this morning through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, with all that said, there's a therefore. What's the reason therefore? Well, we'll talk about that this morning as well. My beloved brethren, listen, Crossway Ministries Church, be ye steadfast, yes. Amen. unmovable. Amen. Be ye steadfast, yes. unmovable, yes. always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What you're doing for this community, what you're letting God do in your life, sometimes at great cost, personally, it seems that way. You'll like the outcome better than if you did know how him to do it. But it seems sometimes that it's just all for nothing. Yeah. It seems sometimes that you're spinning your wheels. It feels like, well, it's not turning out quite like I thought it was going to. But I want you to be steadfast mm -hmm. this morning. Yeah. Knowing that you're on track. Mm -hmm. Knowing that you can take a look back and see where God has taken you from. Yes. And it'll help you get to where he's taking you mm -hmm. and where you're going. Yes. You can be sure that you're not going to fail if your faith is in the right thing. Yes. If your faith is in self, if your faith is in church, if your faith is in organization, if your faith is in, oh, any number of things. Let me just say it simply. If your faith is in anything other than the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. Your faith is in anything other than the Jesus you have never seen. But yet we've already felt him here this morning Amen. and sensed his presence on the inside of you. You know he's real. I said, you know that. You know that. I got to tune up some of you white folk here. Tune up. You know that. See, you got, you got that knower down on the deep inside of you, in the depth of your despair, when you're discouraged, when you're not quite sure. You know. That's right. Amen. And I want to make sure you know when I leave this place this morning, you know yeah. that your labor is not in vain <laughs> in the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. I want to preach a message this morning simply entitled, Press On. <laughs> Press On. I came to tell you this this morning. Press On. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to teach, preach your word to this group of people this morning, this wonderful, fantastic group that you have gathered. Lord, yesterday morning when you dropped this text in my spirit, you knew 
who would be here and you knew what they would need. And I thank you, Lord, that you're an awesome, supernatural, miraculous God that can see the future and can direct the steps of each human being and direct the steps of your messenger to meet the needs of those people. So we ask that the Holy Spirit come this morning, anoint us to teach, anoint us to proclaim, anoint us to preach your word. Let that preaching and teaching be made easy by his presence. And Lord, give encouragement, revelation, insight, but a demonstration of the power of the Spirit flow in this place this morning that men and women, boys and girls, might walk from this place in the power of Almighty God. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. As I said, at times it's easy uh, to get discouraged in your personal walk or in your corporate work. And I think that's probably the downfall of most individuals and even most churches is that we let the devil sit on our shoulder and talk to us and we listen yeah. grace said it thursday night the first thing the devil does is he does it's, it's, it's his name he's deceiver he's a liar he's going to sit here and tell you this ain't working right. you're not going anywhere yeah. this isn't happening this isn't going it's not turning out the way that you thought god told you it was going to turn out well maybe god told you to do something and you just assumed that would turn out a certain way. Right. I know there's a lot of times if God told me to do something, then I think that in order to, for it to be successful, uh, then I think everybody on the planet ought to be involved in it. And, and so when I do it, then everybody on the planet will be involved in it. But that's not necessarily so. As we've opened up these classes to the whole world, we've had great success in it to start off in just a few months. We've seen over 700 uh, people come in and take classes. We've seen uh, six different countries around the world. But it's a tiny little, you know, why isn't it 10,000? Right. Come on, somebody. Yeah. And it wasn't quite, but we're learning and we're growing. And one of the things you have to realize is that God never rushes quality. Right. And your quality, listen, yeah. your quality in his mind. Mm -hmm. He's making quality of believers. Yeah. So things can't go as quickly as we'd like. Yeah. Hey, I'm the guy that wants to reach the finish line tomorrow. But if the finish line is already reached, what's Ooh. left for the rest of our lives? <laughs> God has got our lives mapped out from A to Z. He knows how fast to bring what. And he also knows how fast we can handle success. If some of us got the success we thought we were going to have the first time we did something, we wouldn't do anything more for God. We just kind of sit around on the, on the and be a couch potato in the kingdom. Come on, somebody. So there's a trial of our faith. There is an ongoing movement of the Holy Spirit in our life that changes us. And it gets discouraged sometimes. But I want you to know this morning, God is never discouraged with you. Come on. Yes. The only time that God ever has to turn his back on you is when you quit believing. Come on. When you stop saying it is the will of God. When you stop believing those were the instructions of God. So we've got to lose this idea that uh, success is numbers and aggrandizement and a huge platform and all. Success is simply in the mind of God, you being faithful to what God has given you to do. Amen. Amen. That's success. When you get home, he's not going to say, well done, thou successful servant. He's going to say, well done. Thou good and faithful Amen. servant, Amen. you have done the job. Amen. Amen. You have allowed what I wanted to come into your heart, come into your life, and you've done what is necessary for your life, and you have done what's necessary for my kingdom. Well done, thou good and faithful, and faithful servant. servant. Over the years, I've, I've sat in classes that I taught with two or three people. Talk about a disappointment. You thought you were going to have... Dozens and dozens, and, I, and I've been in prisons where I thought we'd have 50 people show up, and we had two or three. But you know what? God didn't call me to get the numbers. He called me to edify the body. Amen. And it was one person. That's my job. And I'm not, I'm not going to teach different. I'm not going to preach different if there's two people or if there's 20,000 people. It makes no difference to me because what the need is 
place in our lives is for somebody to do what God has said they're supposed to do and not worry about the results. Leave the results in the hand of God. Amen. Are you following? Amen. But yet we can become so discouraged. And, and if people could get discouraged, the Corinthian church would be a good church to show a little discouragement. Number one, uh, they had all kinds of divisions in their midst. They had different people. Well, this is my favorite pe uh, preacher. That's my favorite preacher. That's, right. That's my favorite preacher. And everybody was looking too much to preachers. They had divisions in themselves. They were looking to water baptism as a means of salvation. And Paul had to come along and say, no, 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 no. It's all about the gospel or the preaching the word of the cross. You need to preach Christ crucified. We don't have a lot of uh, uh, smart people, rich people, big people. There's not a lot of Donald Trumps in the church. Come on, somebody. I didn't say Donald Trump isn't in the church. I just said we... Amen. <laughs> but Corinth had divisions. They had schisms. They had immaturity. They had immorality and leadership where a man had taken his father's wife. They had a faulty understanding of the resurrection. They even attacked the man that founded their church. Mm -hmm. There was a division. Some said Paul is evil and others said, oh no, Paul is good. But the guys that wanted to go the wrong way and change the message had to discolor right. Paul's reputation in order to change the message. Yeah, because if good. you can attack the messenger yeah. and you can cause people to think about the idiosyncrasies of the messenger or even the known faults of the messenger, somehow you might be able, not with solid people, but with fickle minded people, you might be a, that don't understand that all of us are just a little weird. Come on. We're just a little strange. And if God is looking for somebody that's not strange to preach this gospel, he's going to have to go to another planet because we are just a little... Amen. Come on. Amen. He called us a peculiar people. Come on. I'm giving the Bible for that. Now, we know that's not what that means, but I'm shooting it out to you. If we look at the humanity that's trying to carry on the work of God, that's of right. course, we'll be disappointed. But what we want to do is not look beyond the man because the man or the woman, the boy or the girl needs to be an example of how they live and how they carry out their life. I got that. But there's only one one that's ever been perfect. That's right. That's so if you come home and live with me for a couple of years, you might find something. <laughs> I can say that because my wife's not here this morning and she won't tell them. <laughs> Inconsistencies we have. Yes. That's right. Idiosyncrasies we have. Right. Strange habits we have. Right. I'm speaking of us as human beings. So if perfection is required to be the messenger, then all messengers are eliminated. Come on. So we don't engage and embrace a messenger that's living a wrong lifestyle, but then on the other side, neither do we eliminate someone because they're a little different. Because we're all, I can't quote this side, so I just, you know. We're all a little different. I mean, a little different. We all look a little different. When I get mad at the world, I go out in the street and hitchhike. People don't know which way I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> you get it. We're all a little strange. But God uses us because He takes us and hides us in Christ, yes. the perfect one. And that's how He sees it. So regardless of how the, the world is operating and how the world is attacking and what's going on in the church... We have to keep moving forward. We have to, here's the message of the title, press on, don't we? And even in Corinth, with all this mess, if you read through it, they had wonderful gifts, but they were all out of order. They didn't know how to operate in them. They had them, but they were all out of order. And by the time you get to 1 Corinthians 15, man, you've got the gifts out of order, immorality, you've got carnality, you've got wrong divisions, you've got schisms, you've got misuse of gifts. You think that Paul would just say quit in 1 Corinthians 10. You've got a huge group of people that are trying to eliminate Paul. You talk about a church that might be discouraged. Plus that, Corinth is right in the center of the most evil and wicked city that exists in its day. In fact, the term to Corinthianize means that you were an immoral person. Come on. Wow. That's how bad it was in Corinth. But this church, listen. 
If this church could survive all of these things that came against it, externally and internally, it would be evidence that God can plant a church anywhere and God can change any life of any person at any time, anywhere, if they're willing to obey by faith the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it was important that Corinth stand. It's important if there's ever been a religious center in the United States, it's got to be southern Louisiana. Whoa. If there's ever been religion stacked up neck deep on every corner, it's got to be south That's Louisiana. Right. That's why God planted you here. Oh, because we've got to have the right in the ministry of darkness. There's got to be salt to the people that are blinded by religious yeah. practice. And I'm not trying. There's as much blindness today in the Protestant ranks as there are in the Catholic ranks. We need to get back, like I said last night, to the simple gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified and leave the foolishness and the organization of religion to those that don't want Jesus, that just want to go to a church where they can ease their conscience for a few minutes and put in their hour and then go. Amen. Amen. Jesus is not a part-time God. Amen. He doesn't want part-time people. Amen. But it's going to cost us something to transfer from being part-time. Boy, if, if he hurries, I could still make NFL today. <laughs> but I still play that. I'm not going to hurry. But like I said last night, I'm not going to preach a Pharaoh message, right? <laughs> Bob Cornell's words, Pharaoh, a Pharaoh message is a message that just won't let you go home. Won't let you go home. <laughs> let's look at verse 50. Let's get, let's grab some encouragement today because we're all in these battles. We're in these, first of all, corp, or individually. Each one of you uh, is, is an invalid part of this church if you're not being changed by the power of the cross. If you're not being changed by faith and grace, if you're not being transformed by faith and grace, then you can't become what God wants you to become. And before you link shoulders with other people, there has to be an individual work going on. Doesn't mean again that every one of you in here has to be perfect before God uses you, because if that's the case, then nobody gets used. That's right. Right? right? But we're being perfected. That's right. So one of the things I want you to be encouraged about, and we're going to grab it from verse 50. Watch this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Corruption. That means that the way that man exists when he is born is not going to be where you end up if, in fact, you are a member of God's kingdom. In other words, what you're born as a person, flesh and blood, just had my grandson, uh, my fifth well, grandbaby born this week. And of course, I wasn't there in the room, but I've been in a couple of birthing rooms. And I know that when they come out, it's all flesh and it's all blood. Somebody say amen. amen. I mean, that's the way we come into the water. It's how we come into this life. And we're flesh and blood. But the Bible says flesh and blood, which is filled with corruption. Now, we don't like that. Oh, that sweet little baby. No, it's flesh and blood and corruption. That's right. And flesh and blood and corruption can't inherit the kingdom of God. But the moment you say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. God no, no longer looks at you as flesh and blood and corruption. That's right. Because he takes the believing sinner, immerses them into the person of Jesus, yes. crucifies them, Amen. eliminates what they were, flesh, blood, and corruption, yes. and buries them in Christ Jesus, Hallelujah. raises them up in Jesus to be a part of him forever, and now we live in Christ, a part of Christ, with a brand new power source, the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit, lives on the inside of us. I, listen, why should I continue? Why should I press on? Because I've already been changed. I said I've already changed. I was dead in trespasses and sins. But now I'm alive in Christ 
Jesus. I reckon myself indeed to be dead indeed unto the sin nature, but I'm alive unto God. I was this, but now I am that. And we ought to shout this morning because I am not what I used to be. Anymore. I'm talking about myself 30 years ago. I'm not where I'm going to be, but I'm not what I used to be. So this morning, I decide, based on the authority that I've already seen operating in my life, the work of the Holy Spirit that's already witnessed the change in my life, we've seen it. My family's seen it. I've seen it. Well, they might haven't seen much, but they've still seen it. So we press on because we're being changed out of flesh and blood to, and, and corruption. And we're moving somewhere. Yeah. We're traveling somewhere. We're on a journey. It's a good journey. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not the same. I'm glad I'm not what I used to be. Yeah. You wouldn't Amen. have liked me 30 years ago. Amen. You I guarantee you I would have been here on Sunday morning 30 years ago. Lord knows where I would have been. But I would have been flesh and blood and corruption, if you'll allow that. But I have been changed. I am a new creation. In Christ Jesus, I've been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. God's given me a new heart. He's gone inside and made a new soul. I want different things. I desire something different than I used to because I'm a new creation with a new soul. I have a new spirit. It's been recreated. And it's been recreated to be able to receive information from the Holy Spirit. Lost folk do not commune with God. But everyone in here who's been born again by the power of the Holy Ghost has the capacity to commune and interact and talk with and receive from God. Hallelujah. Amen. You don't need Brother Larson. You don't need Brother Haber. You don't need Brother Swigert. You don't need the Pope. You've got Jesus. He'll talk to you. He'll speak to you. He'll approve of you. He'll rebuke you. I said he'll reprove you. The Holy Ghost will take you to the woodshed. You think living under grace is so easy? Grace will demand far more from you than law and rules and routines ever would. You know I'm telling the truth. You went to your confessional and you said what you said on Saturday and you left and you did whatever you wanted till the next week because you knew that they were going to say, oh, you know, <laughs> and in the Protestant church, they were going to say, oh, don't worry about it. Grace is easy and God, you're going to always be saved. No, 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 no. If you left church this morning and you're a believer and you turn to your wife and you say something you shouldn't or you turn to your husband and you talk bad to him, Holy Ghost is on you like white on rice because you have been changed. And all of a sudden he repeats it, you ought to shout about it because you have evidence. That's evidence. That's evidence that God that created heaven and earth and sea and sky and all that in them is, is living on the inside of you. You now you can change. You've been changed by the grace of God. By faith and grace, it's the only way it happens. And it doesn't happen all at once. When we, the, the Bible says, Ephesians two eight. For by grace are you saved through faith. Yes, Lord. And there is no other process for change. Hmm. If somebody comes along and says, you can be changed by God doing this, 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 or undergoing that, or experiencing this, this, they're not telling you the truth. The only way. I said the only way. I said the only way. To be saved. And the word saved means to be healed. Means to be protected. It means to be delivered. Yes, I still need 
portions of me still need to be saved, still need to be healed, still need to be protected, still need to be delivered. Can I get a witness here? Amen. And so I still need to operate by faith through grace or for, uh, through grace and faith. How does it work? I place my faith in Jesus. That's right. I'm a name dropper. Get used to it because there is no other name. Get out of heaven. faith in Jesus and the grace of God, the effectual working of the Holy Spirit, the goodness of God, the work of God came to me, not because of what I had earned, but because of in whom I had believed. Amen. I said yes to Jesus and his grace came and took the cocaine away. I said yes to Jesus and his grace came and took the desire for alcohol out. I said yes to Jesus. He came and grabbed out the pornography. I said yes to Jesus and the foul mouth started to go. I don't know. Listen, whatever Jesus starts, Jesus finishes because he's the author and he's the come on somebody. Tell me you say it's taking a while to get this out of me. That's all right. You've got God working on you. It's God working on you. So I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I'm going to finish this journey. But I'm not quitting today. I'm pressing on because I have been changed. I've left behind portions of flesh, blood, and corruption. And I'm headed another way by the process of faith and grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So grace has changed me. I said, grace and faith has changed me. That's why I keep moving today. The Bible says, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But... You have been washed. Yes. You yes. are sanctified. Yes. You are justified. Yes. In the name of the Lord. Yes. I'm looking at squeaky clean this morning. Yes. Because you've been washed in the blood. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Transformed by the power of faith and grace. Yes. All right, so you can just whip that devil off your shoulder and say, I'm not quitting. I've been changed. Amen. I'm not stopping what I'm doing. I've been changed. Yes. It's not all that's going to be changed, but I'm on my way. Yes. And the evidence is, just look back, see what he's done. Yes. Look back, see what he's already accomplished. Look back and see what he's removed. Look back, see what he's added. It'll encourage you to keep on keeping on. Amen. It'll encourage you to press on this morning. Number two, the Bible says a change is coming. And in here we find verses 51 through really 56 of our text. I'll read it again. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Yes, Lord. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This isn't a bad movie. No, no, no. And I saw some movies from the 60s about this that were... <laughs> poorly done but how do you take millions of people all around the world and in the moment in the twinkling of an eye yes. yeah. cause them to disappear Come on. you know it's going to happen don't you yeah, yes. this is not well I don't you don't know in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised Lord. incorruptible, and we shall. Yes, Lord. You're going to say, ha, ah, over on this side, and hallelujah on the other side. Yes. You're going to be still in flesh and blood here, and a moment later, you're going to have a glorified body. Hallelujah. Because there's a promise in God's That's word. Right. And there's coming an hour, and now I have to fight with me. 
I've seen the enemy. Every time I look in the mirror, I see the one rejecting the will of God. I see the one fighting with the Holy Spirit. I see the one refusing to succumb to God's word. And oh, there's nobody standing behind me. It's not a trick question. Come on, say amen. Put those feet out there. Let me stop a little. Because again, we're not as far as we're going to be. But it, when that trump sounds, we're going to be somewhere in that transition. Yes. And at that, at, that la at that moment, when we transfer into this immortal, this being that's no longer corruptible, here's what I'm looking forward to. I'll never have to tell Jesus, sorry, Lord, ever yes. again. Yes. I'll never fail him again, Pastor. Right. I'll never miss it again. I'll never struggle through forgive me Lord one more time I won't ever have to say it I won't have to because because I won't ever fail him again Amen. I mean I can't yeah. even comprehend the joy of that I'll, I'll be too busy praising him I'll be too busy basking in his presence yes. and again this belief this truth is brought to us by the grace of God. Uh, and, and, and I won't go and read all of this, but uh, you know what? Corruptible must put on incorruption. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is thy sting? No grave, where is thy victory? I can tell you that the church doesn't believe in Jesus' return and the rapture because they're too wrapped up in things of the hour, things of the day. When Grace preached already ready, and Joseph came along and preached, gold perisheth. It's those were hard messages to preach. I'd rather swing off a chandelier and, a, you know, and <laughs> preach me something to make me happy. But we need to hear these yeah. because they are the Word of God. Let me tell you something. The Word of God is not dispelled through a lot of sweat and spit and shouting and fast speaking. That's not the anointing. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Style is not the anointing. I said style is not the anointing. Style is not anointed. Truth is anointed. So I can stand here perfectly still if it was in my person to do so and give you truth from a style that's not that's different from what I'm used to, and you'd still get it because the power isn't yeah. in the style. The yeah. power yeah. is in the gospel. Amen. Yeah. And the power is in the truth. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. Right. Amen. So God give us men and women who will stand up and give us a hard message. Yes. And because they're not swinging and spitting and sweating and jumping and yelling and... and doesn't mean they're not anointed. It That's means right. they're giving us truth. And you have to evaluate it based on the word of good, of truth. Because the anointing and style are two different things That's altogether. Right. Style right. should just be what you're comfortable doing. That's how you right. feel comfortable presenting the truth out of your own personality. Yeah. But so much as style is we see somebody do something one way and then we try to mimic that. Come we on. parrot the style. We yeah. think that's well, the anointing. Yeah. No, no. If you'll preach the truth, you can stand stock still and speak that's in right. a slow, quiet voice and the anointing of the Holy Spirit right. would still drive home Amen. the truth. Yes. Yes. Oh, Amen. And the reason I know we're not interested in truth is because the love and the look that needs to be in the Christian's eye for the return of the Lord is not there. Go in your Bibles to Titus, please. Titus chapter 2. Let me show you this. And again, I'm telling you we're going to be changed. But if our preachers aren't preaching the Word of God... And grace and faith is not the process that we're involved in. Well, then we will not, listen to me, we will not be operating and desiring what we should be operating and desiring in. And the grace of God is going to teach you something. Go to Titus chapter 2, verse 12. The grace of God that we said changed us is going to keep changing us. And one of the things it's going to do in us is cause us to be wanting the return of the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Verse 11, let's start there. Titus 2, 2 11. Are you okay? You all right? You still okay with me? Amen. Amen. I have wasted too many. Okay. <clears throat> Titus 2, 11. 
For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Simply means that Jesus has come and offered the kingdom. Titus 2 and 11. And grace, the active work of grace, the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit, watches this, teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Yes, Lord. Yes. So the true grace of God, the true grace of God would rebuke a believer of ungodliness and worldly lust. Yes. And the true grace of God would teach us to live soberly, righteously, and godly. And he would do that, the grace of God, the working of the Spirit would do that by pointing out the error in our life. That's right. yes. If you're doing something wrong, he gets on us, I said it already, like black on night, like white on rice. See, he, he gets on us. Right. And, and, and you, you bear witness to that. Right. Amen. 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 Okay, I got three amens. The rest we're going to have to get you saved because that's what it takes. <laughs> are, you, are you following me? Yes. Yes. How many, listen, you didn't, I'm not going to ask specifics, but how many have ever been, after you were born again, convicted by the Holy Spirit of wrongdoing? Oh, me. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay, the rest of you are going to get saved and it'll work. <laughs> because and I'm, I'm here, I'm making this point, and it, it is laughable. But you've got major movements. Yes. The Grace Revolution. Mm -hmm. yeah. Joseph Prince, Creflo Dollar, preaching grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. And they say that grace is so wonderful that God will never rebuke you. Mm -hmm. That God will, if you hear the voice of a rebuke or a reproof, that's the voice of the devil. Oh. Wow. Bringing a sin consciousness to you. Wow. And if you think about the sin, then you'll perform sin. That is not the message of grace. And I know some of you, and they, they, listen, I am thrilled when I listen. I'll be blunt with you this morning. I am thrilled when I listen to Joseph Prince or Creflo Dollar talk about justification and not to be under law. They're exactly right. They're teaching you right. But then they're taking it too far to this degree. That they're teaching you that grace does not rebuke. Grace does not reprove. That grace, that, that Christians should never, never confess their sin. Because if they confess their sin, they're doing despite to the work of Calvary. This is what, that's not grace. That's error. Every time I fail, thank God I can lose the failure and the effects of it by saying, Jesus, forgive me. And I know that 2,000 years ago, he went to the cross and paid for that. And so a trip back to the cross for me is daily. Daily I'm to go back to the cross. Maybe not for forgiveness, but for strength. And it may be, you know, honestly, if we could see ourselves like God sees us, we'd just live at the foot of the cross. And that's really what's intended. But this verse that I just took you to, Titus 2 and 12, says that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. You're going to have to identify ungodliness before you can deny it. Yes. You're going to have to identify worldly lust yes. before you can deny it. Yes. And they're teaching us, if there's a voice that says that's wrong, that's not God. I My goodness, what a, <laughs> we're losing the ability to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit unless he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you money. I'm going right. to... No. No, no. My God teaches me to deny ungodliness, deny unworldly lusts, living soberly, righteously, and godly. He, de he shows me no to the wrong things. He says yes to the right things, soberness, righteousness, godliness. And look at verse 13. Grace teaches us to look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God. So one of the things that God is going to be working in you, if you will have been changed and are being changed by the grace of God, he's going to plant within you a desire for the return of the Lord. You're going to be looking for it. Now, let's be honest that most of us in our younger years, in our first starting off years, we're not really looking for the Lord. We're trying to experience Him here. We're trying to do something for God. And we're not where Paul was yeah. at the end of his life where he said, man, I'm between a rock and a hard place. Uh, 
part of me wants to go yeah. and be with the Lord, and the other part of me knows that it's better for you yeah. that I stay. Uh, I'm not there yet. I want to see my grandson grow up. Yeah. Yes. I want to see great things done for the kingdom. Not wrong with that. Yes, Lord. But as we mature in grace, yes, Lord. one of the attributes that should be obvious in your heart and your life is come Lord Jesus. Yeah. Yes. It ought to grow dearer to us day by day. Yes. As we mature in the faith, we grow older in the faith, we should see that growing, yes. not disappearing. That's yes, right. Yes. Are you following me? <laughs> so all of us need to pay a little more attention to this. Yeah. We should get up thinking, man, he could come today. Yes. Yes. We should approach right. our lives saying, he, he could come today. Amen. This might be the day. Amen. I said, this might be the day. Yeah, we, you might not make it to evening service, Pastor. Come on, brother. I might not ever make it home again to Baton Rouge. Hallelujah. But I'll be glad to tell the Lord I spent my last hours on earth preaching the gospel to him. Yeah. And when the Lord came, he found me doing what he told me to do. Grace's message, are you ready? Are you doing what God has called you to do? So when grace is flowing and we're operating as we should, we should be rejoicing. Let's hurry and go back to 1 Corinthians. I'm almost done and that means absolutely nothing. <laughs> I just say that to encourage you. Paul did it. He said, finally, brethren, in Philippians 3 and 1, and wrote two more chapters. So, <laughs> finally, brethren. Now I'll move along. Number one, we press on today because we have been changed. Number two, we press on today because we are being changed. And we have hope in the future for that glorious moment when no more change will ever be needed. Yeah, that's right. And I go on and press on today because I know my work is not in vain. Yes, Lord. Every sacrifice, every offering that hurt at the moment. Amen. Okay, we need to work on the offering thing because nobody said amen when I said amen. <laughs> because when you give to the Lord, there'll be times he'll say, no, you were going to buy that washer and dryer, but I want you to give me that. Amen. You were going to go on that vacation, but I want you to Come give on. me that. Come and for the moment, for a brief moment, it hurt. But I've never been disappointed yeah. at what God gave me in return when I gave what he told me to give me. I can take you back. I mean, we talk about, oh, this will take too long. But it's so good. <laughs> Before Joseph was born, my wife and I, we, we didn't, I was working prison ministry. I wasn't on salary at the church. Uh, we, we didn't know where our money was coming from. And so we, 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 had to, we didn't have insurance. Isaiah 53 is pretty good for policy. Um, <laughs> Amen. And so we were a few months from Joseph being born and we were trying to figure out the prenatal care and how to, you know, where to go. And some of the hospitals would do the work based on our income. It was real low. And we were in Easter camp meeting and the Lord said, I want you to give $1,500. I'm a preacher. I got 200 in the bank and 200 in savings, maybe on a good day. And I got three kids at all. And he says, I want you to give $1,500. Well, back in those days, we could do it by a pledge. And so we took, I went to my wife, and you know what? She had the same thing in her heart. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Because, listen, guys, you might be the head, but your wife's the neck. Don't. <laughs> it doesn't work if you don't do it together. Amen. And so we said, okay, let's do that. And so we pledged $1,500. We didn't even know where we were going to where we were going to be able to pay the bill for, or pay her, the, her doctor bill, to pay for her doctor. Well, you know, different things happened and different offerings came in and different people uh, helped us. We never advertised our need. We just prayed and said, Lord, you show us what we need. And, and we found a doctor in Hammond that would do the work for, with Hannah, I think it was $1,200. And then she tells me not to say it this way, but I, I'll, it 
just makes sense to me. The hospital in Hammond had a $900 plop and drop thing, you know, $900 you plop in on Tuesday night, drop the baby 24 hours, you're out of it. <laughs> and I said, it's 50, it's 50 miles away from home, but you know, it, you know, Let's do that. <laughs> it was the only option we had. I mean, women's hospital was charging five or six thousand dollars. We we didn't have it. Didn't have it. And uh, we went to the hospital. We went there uh, the night Joseph was born in August, and everything was fine. Everything went well. Uh, and then they circumcised him, and a couple hours about after that we were going to check out. But they said that uh, when they circumcised him, there was a, 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 a differential in the heart. And I thought, well, yeah. <laughs> there was a rhythm in the heart that didn't make sense. And I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> you cut me, I go, oh. <laughs> But they said, we're going to have to run some tests. The test went on for one day. And the test went on for a second day. The test went on for a third day. And we had paid off that pledge just days before Joseph was born. We were able to somehow do it. We made the last one just ten days before he was born. And when we left that hospital, they handed me a $17,500. Oh, wow. Oh. And in my spirit, I'm thinking, Lord. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And you can get a little discouraged. We're talking about pressing on this week. Yes, and I thought, Lord, I, I, I don't get it. And, and school started a few weeks later in the college, and I'm, I, I'm putting in applications for help from the state because of our income. There were some recourse back then the state would lower your bill overall if you only had so much money etc cetera, etc cetera. and so I did that and, and put it in with the hospital but in my spirit I'm upset mm -hmm. and I'm thinking God you could have done this another way you could you could have done this another way. you could have done something else have you ever questioned God yeah. Ever wonder what in the world are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm going to be paying this bill for 50 years. I don't know how to pay this. I, I don't. I'm struggling to feed my kids. I don't know how to. You know, I don't, I don't know how to do all of this. And I was kind of moping around in church in a service just like this one, in the chapel service when school started. WEBC and Donnie Swagger came, and started to preach and. In the middle of his message, he just mentioned Joseph. He just said the name, Joseph. And the men at Pitt have to forgive my emotion. But the minute that he said it, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and told me this about that little baby boy. He said, he will be like Joseph of old. I will position him to bring bread to his people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sitting right in the front seat. Preacher said one thing, I got another. And I said, God, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care if it takes me 5,000 years. Amen. Bring it on. I'll pay this thing. <laughs> but you just told me that my son was going to be used by the Lord to bring bread to his people in a time of famine. He's faithful. And it's been a struggle at times as Joseph was growing. But last Sunday night, he stood on the platform of Family Worship Center Amen. and didn't sing, but he preached the gospel. Amen. He broke bread to God's people yes, in a time. say, well, that's the end of the story. Oh, no. <laughs> I ended up putting that material in, and I'm going to hurry, and I'm about done. And that's not. <laughs> I was waiting for the paperwork to all come back to give me a final bill. The state would reduce it some. And I waited, and August turned to September. September turned to October. October, November. 
And now I'm getting nervous because the last thing I want coming to my house is that notice yeah. that said you have avoided a bill and we're going to start taking money yeah. from you. I don't want that. And so I went to prayer in December. I said, Lord, what should I do? As January rolled around, I'm still praying. What do I do? And he told me, don't do anything. Just wait. Don't do anything. Just wait. So I waited. January, no bill. February, no bill. March, no bill. April, no bill. Well, I lived on that don't say anything in January for a while. But May comes around, and again, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian. I don't want a bill collector knocking on my door. Lord, can I write the hospital and tell them the situation and spell it out and say, where's my bill? I mean, you know, I'm a Christian. I don't want them to come looking for me. So I got in my spirit that, yeah, we could. So at the end of May, June, 1st of June, I wrote a letter to the administrator of the hospital, said, this is what I know. This is what I did. This was the bill that I received. I've been waiting on a bill, and I've received no correspondence from anybody. And I don't, I don't want it to go to collections, and I don't want to have my credit ruined, and I'm a Christian. I pay my bills. I'm not, do I'm not dodging this. I got a son that's going to grow up and preach the gospel in a time of famine. I'm good. Give me the bill. And I sent the letter in the end of May, early June. All of June, all of July, no letter. End of August, a year after he's born, I walk out to the mailbox and there's a letter from a collection agency that says, you owe $17,500 and you've been ducking and you better call me right now. Oh, no. Open up the letter, call the people. And I told him, I tried to tell him what I just told you. And the guy on the other end of the phone, oh, yeah, you're a Christian. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're past, oh, you work with Jimmy Swagger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and you've been trying to pay this bill, but no one would give you a bill? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't send me, I said, I'll, I'll write you a check for $100. Well, and I'll send it now. And we'll get this thing started. But this is what I didn't want. So now I'm thinking, what do I do? And I called the hospital administrator in Hammond. And I got the right lady on the line. And I said, Lord, I said, Lord, I said, uh, this is Lauren Larson. And, and I, I, I sent a letter. What? And the lady said, oh, oh, yeah, I know your file. I know it real well. And I said, well, um, I just got a letter from a collections agency that said I owed you 17500 and and that it hadn't been paid, and this is what I've been trying to avoid. She said, oh, well, you didn't get my letter then. And I said, no, well, I, I didn't. I've got connected with this other guy. And she said, oh, Mr. Larson, you need to understand, you submitted the paperwork just like you were supposed to, but by January, we had to have submitted that paperwork on your behalf, or you lost the opportunity to have that benefit. And for whatever reason, in January, remember how pushed I was to call and God said, no, not now. In January, we missed the deadline. And so you're not going to get any break of three or 4,000 off of that 17,500. I just wrote you a letter that told you that if, uh, because it was our fault that you didn't get your discount, we've eliminated your whole deal. <laughs> fees on a $17,500 oh, wow. bill, and you will never convince me that God didn't ask me for $1,500 for his work and protect me from $17,000. You'll never convince me. Now, I've lost, but I haven't. Your work is not in vain. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The growth that can sometimes hurt. The giving that we sometimes don't understand. The faith God is asking you to exhibit 
in your personal life and the work of this church today, it's not going to be a thing. Amen. Amen. It's not going to be for nothing. You're being changed. Yes. You have been changed. You will be changed. Amen. But because of your effort and your work and your commitment and your faithfulness to take on the roles that are needed for this church to move forward, there's going to be a light that's established. Yes. People are going to walk. Through that door and hear the gospel preach. Broken and hurting, they're going to give their lives to Jesus. They're going to become new creations in Christ Jesus. They're going to hear the message of faith and grace. They're going to hear the message of the cross. And they're going to grow. And they're going to be transformed. How many? I don't know. I'm not going to promise you a number because God's interested in quality. Amen. But here's... Here's what I promise you. Pick four. My beloved brethren, that's you. Be ye steadfast. Be sound. Be steady. Take a chair. Find a base. Be sound. Be unmovable. Yes, Lord. Don't let family, circumstances, yes, situations stop you yes, from fulfilling the will of God for you. Because souls are in the balance. Lives are hanging in the balance based on what you will or will not do. God does not have a substitute waiting for you in the wings yes. if you fail. Right. You're it. Mm -hmm. You're it. You're his plan. Mm -hmm. You're his man. You're his woman. Mm -hmm. You've been placed there. Mm -hmm. No one else is waiting to take your place. God's got a place for everyone. Mm -hmm. Be steadfast. Unmovable. I've been fired from Family Worship Center for lack of funds for two different times over the last 25 years. I said, well, can I stay and just do what I'm doing anyway? <laughs> Be settled, steadfast, <clears throat> unmoved. And just about the time you think you can't do anymore, yeah. you can't give anymore, you can't work anymore, Man, I just not, I don't hear, come back to this verse and say, wait a minute, it says always abounding. When you get to your limit in the natural, ask for God's grace yeah. to do a little more, to go a little longer, yeah. to be a little more stable, to do a little bit more for the work of God. Always yeah. abounding because... You know that your labor, your faith, your giving is never in vain. It's never falling to nothing. You're a part of something here that God wants to grow. He's going to grow you personally. He's going to grow you corporately. So, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For you know that your labor is not in vain. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work in honor and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding because we know.